Good morning, everybody. My name is Crispin Son. I'm the chairman of Food Forward South Africa. I'm also chairman of the foundation and a board of members. Welcome today. I hope you all coffeeed up and teed up for our next hour and a half together. And um, this really is a momentous occasion, certainly for me personally and uh, for Food Forward. Um, I've been involved in food security for the past 16 years. Um, uh, I was food forward as well as with its predecessor organizations. Um, for a very long time, we've been feeling like the Dutch boy with a finger in the dike wall, pretty much just trying to stop the water from getting through the wall by helping to feed people who are most vulnerable. And for a long time, we battled with ensuring how we start influencing policy and how we start moving the tide back. Um, this is represents a unique opportunity for us to start thinking and dealing with food security in a much more holistic manner, for us to apply a bit of intellectual capacity and start thinking through things, thinking how we start changing the system, how we start dealing with policy and make some policy interventions. Um, we for a long time have had the view that we absolutely have the ability to eradicate hunger in South Africa during our lifetime. It's an imminently possible and unambitious goal. The, all the statistics will reveal and some of the presenters will show the statistics and talk about it today, that a third of the food produced in South Africa is lost to waste. Uh, that represents about 10 million tons of food annually. And Food Forward exists primarily for the purpose of finding a way of connecting communities that are most vulnerable and food insecure with food that is surplus in production and often goes to waste. Our job is to try and link those two communities and very often the waste and, uh, and the manifestation of that waste in the form of hunger is a consequence of uh, a supply chain that battles with the cost and complexity of matching those two uh, communities. We've existed for the last 12 years, specifically in the form of food bank and its predecessor organizations, which goes back about 16, 17 years to try and fill that gap. Um, we believe it's possible and we're excited today to hear from you in how you contribute and some of the senses that you have and insights you have of how we could make that happen a lot more efficiently. As we all engage with this process of food security, it's quite obvious that we, def we learn different lessons. Some of us learn the same, uh, same lessons. We learn some of the things that we're not doing well and where we've made mistakes. And then we also learn some of the things that we do extremely well and we improve on that year on year. Food Forward constantly looks for ways to improve our efficiencies and getting more food to more people in a much more efficient way. Today, we want to learn from you. We seek food feedback from people to understand what are the insights you have. So my invitation to you is please don't hold back. My career has taught me that assumption is quite frequently the mother of all cock-ups. And very frequently we have an, we make an assumption and we build a whole story and a model and a case around an assumption. So part of these engagements is to try and debunk some of those assumptions, to challenge it, to share ideas. And uh, this is one of the platforms we hope to use to do that. So welcome to the world of virtual engagement. I'm sorry we won't have an opportunity to, to touch each other, shake hands and to see each other face to face, but hopefully over time that becomes possible again. I'm really pleased for, to have the panel uh, who will be uh, participating in today's event. Uh, we all are looking forward to the insights we'll hear. And I'd also like to, in closing with my introduction, welcome Namshla Skohia Katia. Um, Namshla is a director of Food Forward South Africa and uh, plays a prominent role on our board of directors. She's a qualified food technologist um, and she's got uh, qualifications in, in financial uh, uh, planning and assessments. 
Uh, Namshla is, has worked in industry as a food technologist with retailers such as Pick and Pay and Woolworths and has qualifications um, in, in, in the global impact of food security. So Namshla, we are extremely happy to have you. Nice to see you again. And I'm going to hand over to Namshla, who will facilitate our first session titled Scaling Through Partnership, Economic and Environment Impact. Namshla, good to have you and I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Crispin, for that great introduction. Good morning, everybody. A special welcome to our session one, to our very, uh, to our session one of our very first Food Forward South Africa webinar. With me today is our very own managing director, MD Duplessis, who is here to tell us how Food Forward South Africa responded to COVID-19 pandemic. Also with me and on the panel are some of our valued stakeholders, Zinzim Kolodela, who is the director of corporate affairs at Woolworths. Andre Nell, the General Manager for Sustainability at Pick and Pay. Alexander Hall, Group Sustainability Executive at Mesmat. Mary Jane Morifi, Chief Corporate Affairs and Sustainability Officer at Tiger Brands. Tatiana von Bormann, Acting Head of Policy and Futures Unit at World Wildlife Fund, shortly known as WWF South Africa. Without taking time, any more time, I hand over to you, Andy. Thank you, Namshla, and uh, thank you very much for, for introducing our, our panelists. This is, this is very exciting, and as you and Crispin both say, quite a momentous occasion for, for, for all of us at Food Forward SA, but not just for us, um, it's also momentous for our partners, um, some of them represented on this panel today, and of course our beneficiary organizations. Um, you know, what we're able to do, we can only do because of partnerships. Partnerships allow for these kind of possibilities. So, so thank you very much to you all. Uh, before I go into my presentation of how Food Forward SA has responded. We're now 12 months into the pandemic, um, and I'll just give some oversights of what our organization has, has done and how we responded. But I would like to just say hi to and acknowledge our panelists for the first session. These are retail partners, and they've been amazing uh, supporting us. And I want to acknowledge, even before I make this presentation, that we were only able to do what we did because uh, companies like Tiger Brands and Woolworths and Pick and Pay and Food Lovers Market and MassMart responded. You know, when, when I was on the call with them, all they said to me was, Andy, what do you guys need? What does Food Forward need? And I want to just say thank you to all of you and acknowledge you, along with our other supply chain partners, um, for your for your partnership, for your generosity, and for just walking along with us to make sure that we respond effectively in the manner in which we do. I'm going to go right into the presentation. Um, I hope everyone can see that. Namshla, can you see that? OK, excellent. OK, I'm going to go right in. So uh, what did we do as Food Forward ESA in, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic? Let me first start by saying that what Food Forward ESA does uh, is connect this world of excess or surplus, which we find throughout the supply chain, to a world of need. Um, and I don't need to give our panelists and our people on this webinar any need for context uh, about what the need is out there. Our core business is the recovery of edible surplus food from farmers, manufacturers, wholesalers and retailers. And we call this cost effective model food banking. This is just a graphic representation of what food banking is. On the left hand side of the equation, we work with farmers directly and through agri associations. We work with manufacturers like Tiger Brands, Nestle and others. We work with wholesalers like MassMart and and, and the rest, as well as retailers like Pick and Pay, Woodworths, Food Lovers Market. 
um, and we we get the surplus offtake, which is good quality within date edible surplus food that we are able to use to make sure that we feed people. And then on the right side of the equation are the beneficiary organizations um, that desperately need our food, but that are able to use that food instead of that food being incinerated or dumped in landfill. Uh, we are living in strange times indeed, and the, the stranger thing is that we are getting so used to living in strange times. We can't hug one another. We can't shake one another's hands. We've got to sanitize all the time throughout the day. We've got to wear masks so we hardly recognize one another when we're walking past one another. And that's just the, the situation we find ourselves in. But I think it's important that we that we understand that we were in a crisis before the pandemic. Our economy was, was sluggish before the pandemic. People were hungry before the pandemic. Poverty and inequality were at high levels well before the pandemic. And all the pandemic did was just further excessive, exacerbate this crisis. Unemployment is sitting at 42% when we take the broad definition of employment into consideration. And I'm not sure why all of us don't quote the broad definition because that's a more realistic definition of, of the poverty, of the inequality out there and how that is impact on people's inability to, 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 to affect uh, positively their own livelihoods. Our economy has slumped significantly in the last 12 months. Many businesses have closed down or shrunk their businesses, retrenched staff just in the hopes of survival, and our business confidence outside there is low. Last week we saw the business confidence index released and there was a slight uptake, but the sentiment out there, generally speaking, is still low, which means you know business is quite hesitant at this time to grow, to scale, to take on more people, to increase uh, uh, their operations. And so that's where we find ourselves in. Poverty and hunger are widespread, around 30 million people are vulnerable and we have to consider that and we have to understand that this poverty and hunger has to be understood in this context of inequality. A lot of our people in South Africa just can't afford to buy healthy food. They can't access food to survive and it's important that we that we recognize that. Also um, embarrassing to say, but South Africa has the highest level of stunting in the world, sitting at 27%. Stunting is a nutritional deficiency where children are too short for their age. Um, and this leads to other developmental inadequacies years later, which you cannot undo after a certain age. And this is really, uh, when you look at other developing countries, and, and how they have um, not done as, as bad as we have. I think this is really something that we've got to take a good hard look at because children are our most vulnerable group and they are not getting the proper nutrition that they need um, in the first 1000 days. Um, and this is where we need to make that impact. Government does not have the capability to address escalating hunger and hunger relief organizations throughout South Africa are struggling to keep up with the demand at present. So I think it's important to understand that we are still in a crisis. We have not, um, you know, we're not even in recovery mode yet. We are still very much in a crisis. Which programs have we scaled up? We've, we've scaled up warehouse food banking, a virtual food banking model, which I'll share about a bit more, which is food share. Second Harvest, our direct outreach program to farmers and growers and producers. We've updated our, uh, our mobile rural depots as well as our food parcel program, which is a targeted intervention. So again, I'd like to recognize that we were able to respond effectively and immediately. Uh, I remember that we had to make application uh, for us to be able to operate as an essential service and um, we did it quite quite quickly and we were able to, to get the certificates we needed to be able to operate. Um, and thanks to generous food and financial donors, we could respond immediately and scale up. The first thing we did was because we were operating prior to the pandemic in only six of the nine provinces, we had to scale up into all nine provinces. So, so provinces like Limpopo, Pumalanga, the Northern Cape um, and the Free State needed specific attention because some of the poorest provinces are even concentrated there. So the first thing we did was scale up into all nine provinces. The second thing we did, and again, thanks to financial support, we had to increase our fleet. 
We bought these trucks that you see there. There's one of these based in Joburg, one in Cape Town, and then we've got other fleet as well that we had to purchase eight ton trucks, five ton trucks, and uh, we got a truck donated, a five ton truck donated by the Department of Social Development, which just helped us upscale um, and, and reach more people. What we also needed to do, and we are still doing, is is make sure we get larger warehouses because you can see on, on, on the left hand photo there you see a whole lot of maize meal and pulchards that was donated um, by MassMart. Um, MassMart took a decision and the staff took, the executives took a 30% pay cut and they transferred that 30% pay cut uh, to purchase food and they gave us food valued at millions of rands um, and so we were able to use that food, get it out to people that need it. Almost immediately, we were able to respond. Um, our Joburg and Cape Town warehouses are, are now, and, and Durban warehouses were too small. We managed to find a larger facility in Durban, and we are looking for a larger facility in uh, in Johannesburg. And in Cape Town, we are building a, 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 a fit for purpose warehouse for our food banking activities. It's a 1,700 square meter under roof facility, which will accommodate our national head office staff. On the left hand side, the admin offices, and then on the right hand side, uh, a larger warehouse, which is four times the size of our current warehouse, um, and will also house larger cold room facilities and just be able to create better efficiencies. Um, we break ground on the 1st of April, and uh, we hope to have this warehouse ready by the end of the year. Our warehouse food banking distribution, the last financial year, we distributed just over 5,000 tons. And uh, th at the end of this financial year, which was February for us, we distributed 7,200 tons. So a 40% increase in the amount of food that went through our organization. And we were able to increase meals from 20 million to 29 million meals. We also managed to keep our cost per meal at 85 cents, which is the same as what it was last year, in spite of the fact that our, our, our financial costs increased quite a bit. Then what we found was with the platform uh, was inactive during hard lockdown because nobody was able to move around. So food share was not active and people weren't able to collect food from stores. But it made our retail partners realize the importance of the connection between a retail partner, Food Forward SA, and the beneficiary organizations getting that surplus food. And as a result, we are in the process of rolling out uh, uh, pick, uh, 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 food share with Pick and Pay, with Woolworths, and with Food Lovers Market. And um, Alex may mention it later, but we're in the process of, of reaching an agreement with MassMart to join uh, Food Share in some of their stores uh, nationally as well, which is quite exciting. This food share platform, the digital platform, will allow us to make sure that we get more food to more people, even in rural communities across the country. On second harvest, uh, we, because there was huge amounts of disruption on the supply chain, we were able to get better access to nutritious food, uh, which helped us quite a bit. And it also allowed us to strengthen partnerships and form partnerships with agri associations like, like Agri XA, Citrus Growers Association, NetBank Agri, and Standard Bank Agri. And because of that, we were able to get more nutritious food, allowing the, the, the food basket to be uh, more than 80%. In fact, it's 81% of nutritious food we were able to achieve in the past financial year. Also, we were able to reach more rural communities. We, we increased from six rural communities to 13, and significantly today, we open up our 14th mobile rural depot out in Mtata, out in the Eastern Cape, um, and um, we will be opening up a further 17 more rural community depots, getting food into vulnerable rural communities like Mtuba Tuba, um, and uh, out in Queenstown and, and, and other places, making sure that rural communities get enough food. So right now, 15% of our total beneficial organization population uh, gets uh, is represented by rural communities, and that will increase in the coming months. What we what we also had to start doing was provide food parcels. We, we generally don't like food parcel programs because they are expensive to implement and making sure that food reaches the intended beneficiaries is not always easy because we require things like ID numbers, whole people's homes. Uh, but what we've managed to do was we've partnered with the Department of Health in the Western Cape, for example, as well as uh, beneficiary organizations that have social workers, dietitians, and community health workers that are able to assess the need in people's homes in communities. So now we are able to make sure we get a food parcel directly to people's homes. 
um, and we're targeting COVID-19 patients that have lost the ability to earn an income, as well as other people with chronic conditions um, who are breadwinners and have lost their ability to earn an income. Also vulnerable families. We support quite a number of organizations that support child headed households and they are now able to get food to support them every single month as well as rehabilitation programs providing food and acting as an incentive for people to complete programs. Our beneficiary organizations nearly doubled from 570 to 1005, which was a 76% increase, and that's the spread, uh, the wheel, wagon wheel of where our food goes. The impact stats, 7,200 tons, we were able to distribute 29 million meals, cost per meal at 85 cents, and reaching nearly half a million people on a daily basis. I'm very excited to also announce, and, and I won't talk a lot about this because Tanner from Impact Amplify will, will talk more about this, but the exciting thing for us is that we've, we've commissioned a study, an independent study of the social return on investment impact of our model. And the study in, in summary found that for every one rand donated to Food Forward SA, 98 rands worth of social, social, social return of investment uh, is generated. So for the last financial year, one or, or the previous financial year, 1.6 billion rands worth of SROI was generated in our 2019-2020 financial year at a cost of only 15 million rand. Not only that, but the, for every kilogram of food donated, we are able to unlock 117 rands worth of social returns um, uh, in, in economic value, allowing for 588 million rands worth of food value created because beneficiary organizations save huge amounts of money. They were able to cook more meals uh, because of our model. So this is this is very exciting for us. So what we what we are proving here is that uh, our food banking model is not only addressing short term hunger, but we are transforming communities at the same time. So why does food banking work? It's economical. The cost per meal is only 85 cents. It's sustainable because we good we use good quality donated surplus food that 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 would have ended up being incinerated or being dumped in landfill, and we're using this to feed people. Every single one of our beneficiary organizations gets food every single month. We don't drop food in a community and then disappear. Our communities get food every single month to make sure that we are transforming communities using food as an incentive. Our social impact is measurable and Tanner will talk about that in the next session. Um, and our surplus food is a catalyst to transform communities. Our focus has always been and will continue to be that 75% of our beneficiary organizations focus on education, vulnerable children, women and youth, and more than 80% of our food is nutritious. Our panelists will talk more about this, but 11 of the 17 sustainable development goals are promoted through our food banking model and uh, it's environmentally friendly. That's it from my side, uh, Namshla. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you Andy, for a, a great presentation. I really take away from this presentation that, you know, the work that we're doing at Food Forward South Africa, you know, it is, it is, it is measurable. So the social impact is, 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 is measurable. And I really look forward to Tena giving us a bit of more detail on that measuring. Um, as an as an as an as an as an next move, I think I need. To, uh, let me just maybe put some. I really pressed for time, so I'm going to really try and get through all the panelists' questions, and if they can help me with also just shortening their feedback, and also you know, give us feedback on the questions as succinctly as possible, and. I'm going to go straight away with our first, um, you know, a, a panel a member, which is from Professor Andy has, and he has just, you know, mentioned in his presentation, you know, how 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 the the pandemic, how the how the impact has been in terms of food security has been on the on the on, during the during the pandemic on 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 you know on the on the supply and also just the security itself of the food. At the start of the pandemic and with the hard lockdown that suddenly uh, thrust upon us, um, retailers had to really uh, rapidly adjust. If you can just tell us, Lindsay, what did Woolworths do in response to this hard lockdown measures? Thank you, Namsa. Um, I hope I, I had some glitches. I hope they were from your side, not mine. Uh, <laughs> 
So please let me know if um, um, you're struggling to hear me, but I, I did a good check, I should be fine. So um, how did we respond to the pandemic? Wow, um, that's a big question and I'm sure uh, <laughs> um, everyone looks back and reflect on that and think, how did we do that? How did we survive that? Um, I think what was important for us as a business was really to um, stay true to our true north, our purpose as a business and our values. And we find when we do that, we really, um, you know, sail through any, um, you know, any winds or any volatility. Um, so I think staying true th to those values for us was really good at this time. Um, that uh, that crisis itself put our purpose and values to test. Um, it allows us to be more agile. We needed to respond immediately. Um, we set up teams, um, agile teams, to be able to respond to the different aspects um, of the business that we needed to attend to. But very importantly, we knew that we need to start home. We need to look at the safety of our people, the well-being of our people, and then move into the community. And when we ventured into the community, um, I need to mention um, that it was very important to stay close to government and make sure that anything that we do in response, whether internally or externally, is aligned with the government thinking um, and abide by the regulations that um, at the end were proving quite frustrating. I'm sure my colleagues will agree with me. Um, but it was very important to stay close to that. Uh, we were in forums where we, we, we quickly needed to get an understanding of um, the terminology, and also making sure that um, we understand deeply the regulations and how they will impact our operations and how we respond to the to the and you would know that in a crisis you just want to reach out and help um, but the, res the restrictions were there for a reason we're there to make sure that as we build um, as we maintain livelihood we we, we we protect lives at the same time so yes, we um, went into the community, um, having taken care of our own people, making sure that they safe um, as, as essential workers. And I'm sure everyone here agrees they were our heroes for that time, particularly on hard lockdown. And then we needed to respond to the community. What was really nice for us is that Ulus is already on a journey of really addressing and contributing to food security. And we've got partners, we've got partners like Food Forward, partners like Gift of the Givers. Um, in fact, most of our partners in the community aspects are focusing on food security. And where to go there and look at what is it that they're doing? How can we leverage on that, um, leverage on their skill, you know, and their understanding of the environment? and respond accordingly. And what we didn't leave behind also is to invite our customers to be part of the journey. Um, we had in our stores uh, customers collecting and, con and donating food, um, collecting in trolleys. We had uh, and we had to set up that whole process to make sure that they collected and they're given to the right people um, across the country. And then uh, we also we we also um, did our own fill a bag campaign, where we got customers to contribute to you know uh, food parcel donations, um, and that was quite a thing and a quite a campaign. It felt like a movement, in fact, um, which was great. So that I, I think for me, Namsha, would be the summary of how we responded and maybe the relevance to the topic at hand. Mentioned, so you mentioned that you 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 have you've also gone into the, some of the communities. What was the kind of work or what kind of partnerships did you have to do with the communities? What did, what were your findings in the communities to assist with these food security issues? Our uh, Namsa, we took a lot of cue from our NGO partners like Food Forward, like Food, uh, Gift of the Givers. Um, as Andy mentioned, they 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 understood what they needed to do to sign up and become um, essential workers themselves. So um, 
well, our role was really to make sure that we support those strategies. They understand grassroots better. Um, they were set up, they ramped up to respond, and we just had to tap in with what we um, what we need um, to tap in with. I think it's always important for us, our approach in terms of community development is that we go into partnerships. We are a business um, and they understand communities and grassroots better than we do. Um, and we trust them, you know, to really do. And they haven't, you know, they haven't failed us, not once, you know, in terms of making sure that the response is right, the response goes to the right people. Uh, we had ideas. I mean, I remember in some of our um, deliberations, we had grand ideas. But um, the minute we have an NGO telling us this is this is the situation um, on the ground and this is how we need to be respond, we back off. Um, because as a corporate, what do we know? You know, um, so we took a cue from our NGO partners all the time. So if you could think in hindsight, do you think there is anything Thing that that is different. Um, um, I struggled with your question, Namsha. Are, are you saying if if in so hindsight, saying, in hindsight, hindsight would have done what? Differently? Correct. Yes. Yeah. What would have done differently? I think we did well. Um, um, and the, the the proof of that is that we've had no comebacks, and if anything, we've had um, you know a lot of acknowledgement for you know lives being touched. I think we had a lot of um, individual stories of how people felt we touched their lives, and for us also the. <clears throat> We didn't go um, 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 branding so much. You know, what was important is the difference that we make. So they could have thought it's that particular NGO doing the work, and that's okay. But we got enough to think we did well. We didn't have comebacks. We didn't have complaints. Um, we're still delivering um, food parcels, by the way, um, and, and where it's needed, and we're still adapting them. I mean, the, la the last parcel donation we did, a uh, drop we did with a uh, gift of the givers, in that particular community, they needed water, and we adapted to make sure that they, they get water. So the partners are good to say, you know, Yes, the parcel is good, but this community needs this more than that, and we responded to that. Um, it was a crisis. Um, we learned the the lessons we've learned is our agility, our resilience, um, and we're desperate as a business to make sure that what we've learned about ourselves in this time, we keep it and we build on it in the business. Um, those for me would be the lessons, but doing things differently. I think I can only, on behalf of the company, thank all our NGO partners in how they've really partners us to respond appropriately, relevantly, and make a meaningful impact. Thank you very much, Sinzi, for your great response. I will be taking some questions online. So for the audience that is online, you're welcome to send through your questions, and we may be coming back through to you, Zin. If we got next uh, uh, panelist, um, Andre from uh, Pick and Pay. So there has been a, a mention from Andy's uh, pr uh, presentation to say that we uh, the, the pandemic has exacerbated an already existing crisis in terms of food hunger or in terms of poverty and people not able to access nutritious food. I understand that Pick and Pay has created a Feed the Nation uh, Foundation, which has become a really great milestone for Pick and Pay. I also am in understanding that there is a pilot initiative between Food for South Africa, Feed the Nation Foundation, as uh, well as the Western Cape Department of Health, which was launched on the 29th of January of this year. And this is going to identify and expedite food support to patients with compromised immunity who have lost their ability to earn an income. My question to you, um, Andre, is how did the pandemic inform the strategy for this foundation, for the foundation's creation, and what is its role into the future? Um, thank you. I just want to check if you can hear me. Yes. Okay. okay. 
Oh, luckily you can't see me and that's probably a blessing. Um, so we actually started in February last year um, as the issue around um, COVID became more apparent. Um, started distributing soap um, through the Pick and Pay School Club. Um, so we supported quite a large number of schools. Um, and then, you know, as the lockdowns were introduced, I mean, it just became apparent with the shutdown of the feeding programs, um, you know, it, it was a nightmare. Um, so then we launched the, the Feed the Nation um, campaign. Um, essentially, what we used is to use the network that Pick and Pay has got. So all our suppliers, um, some of our logistics partners, um, foundations that Pick and Pay um, work with. Um, to get funding from companies, to get um, food donations um, from companies, and then use what we're good at, and that is to, to, to store things and to pack things and to take them somewhere. Um, and that's how Feed the Nation Foundation was started. So it's grown substantially. I mean, since then, the I think we've raised more than 135 million rand has been donated. Um, 28 million meals have been distributed. Um, and the success is really just showing the the huge generosity, I think, in, in at one level of companies, but also the, the level of risk awareness that they do have. Um, that if we do not urgently address these issues in our communities, um, certainly for business, just at a business level, that's it's 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 extremely risky. Um, so how the process works is we basically all the well not basically every um, monetary donation um, gets converted into food. So we use our stores to pack the the, the food hampers. Um, we use our trucks to distribute them. Um, so there's no additional costs for someone donating funds in terms of you know having to move the food or store it or having security at handovers. Unfortunately, the kind of things that 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 we now have to do because there's such need. Um, that you do need to have security and that kind of thing in place, in addition to the no normal, you know, the, co the COVID safety rules. Um, so, I mean, it is a success in terms of, yes, we've distributed now millions of meals, um, but, you know, sadly, it's not really something that we we want to to celebrate in that sense. Um, Food Forward has been a partner for us from, from the beginning, um, and the, the, the program with uh, Feed the, the Nation, um, is is complementing the work that we do with, with Food Forward. I mean, they are still our only partner collecting food from our from our stores, um, and so all the excess food goes to them. I think it's 1,500, 600 tons every year that is donated that gets turned into meals. Um, really, I mean, it's just a superb organisation that's that's been with Pick and Pay for a long time. And Feed the Nation Foundation is where we use stock that we've got in the stores that then gets distributed. And um, the recent new partnership that Andy um, headed in terms of the Western Cape uh, Health Department, um, it's close to ours because I mean a number of our employees and our board, many people have had COVID, so it's something we understand. Um, and I think if you've had someone close to you or just know of someone, if you can't imagine how they would survive if they don't have food. Um, so it's really a superb initiative and Andy is busy working with us um, in terms of how we can take the, the program national to, to other provinces as well. You mentioned earlier, Andre, that, that um, it, uh, not, not partnering with organizations such, your, such as Food for South Africa and not playing your part in terms of um, you know, feeding the nation would create you know a risk what are some of the risks that you would that you're referring to that you know that could show up there well i mean just i mean off the, the bat i mean just your social stability um the safety of people in our country um and then all the other things that i mean that that for example that annie spoke about i mean in terms of the future of education in our country i mean the, the schools are already so severely under resourced just in terms of the buildings and the equipment that they've got, um, and the kids don't have food. Um, many feeding programs are still not up and running like they should be, um, and that's a huge risk because we already have issues in terms of education of the of the kids that are supposed to be coming out of school and become leaders. And they 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 don't have, if you don't have food, you know it's not gonna it's not gonna happen. 
We've also seen, I mean, the initial focus in the last year for Feed the Nation Foundation has been a lot of focus on child-headed households. I mean, there's not an exact number. I mean, we've got about 140, 150,000 families that we, the count that we're working on. Um, we've supported about 5,000. Um, our goal for this for this year is 5,000. We supported 4,000 last year. Um, but I mean, that's a drop in the ocean compared to the 140, 50,000 um, children that's looking after families. So if they don't have access to food, I mean, your whole family structure that's already under severe strain is just, it's just going to collapse. So then on the business side, if you ignore all those things, you're not going to have people that are able to shop with you. They're going to come to your stores to loot them instead. So if you, if you don't care about anything, you just care about money, think about that. So it's all about the sustainability of the country. Yeah. Thank you very much, Andre. My next question, I think, it goes to um, Alex uh, from Mesmat. So Mesmat response responded very quickly, you know, uh, to the rapid rise in food in food uh, insecurity, which was associated with the pandemic. Would you say that this rapid response is now helping to guide your current and future food security initiatives? Yeah, and that's a, that's a good question. We, we're really glad to gratify that um, it was felt that we responded quickly. We really try to, um, um, mo you know, mobilize resources as quickly as we could. Um, looking back, it was a time of uh, tremendous upheaval and concern. And I, I certainly for us, we weren't, it, I mean, it wasn't immediately obvious what the right thing to do was. And I think it, just to echo everybody else who's spoken, being able to rely upon really skilled and experienced NGO partners who can advise and guide is a critical aspect of this because at the time the response, you know, there were millions of responses that we could have considered. It became apparent though that food security was going to be a tremendous issue. We knew it was an issue before, but with people being um, unable to work, we knew that this was going to be a growing problem. And so our focus was trying to look within our business and work and, and really leverage our business skills to, to address this. And in so doing already, uh, similar to the other retailers, you know, our skill or our ability is in procuring food um, very affordably, moving it affordably, and making it accessible to people. And so we saw an opportunity to really increase um, our participation in that space. Uh, last year, we, we were really proud that we donated directly about 640 tons of food. But in engaging with Food Forward more closely, in looking at the scale of the issue, um, it became clear that we needed to pivot our focus a little bit. So historically, we've, we've looked at nutrition primarily in the area of education. So supporting nutrition schemes that improve educational outcomes. But looking and working with Andy and team, it's clear that the nutritional requirements that we need to address go well beyond that. And so for us, it's about trying to take that, that our scale in terms of our buying power and utilize it to provide food more accessibly and affordably to NGO partners but also to try and reduce food waste wherever we can. Um, it's, it's a really problematic issue when we have good food that's not going to get towards feeding people in a country where we have uh, food insecurity rates that we currently face. So as part of that, once we got through the initial phase of making food accessible, we started to engage in discussions around how we could, we could better partner with Food Forward. And the, and the obvious opportunity there was really around the food share network uh, one of the biggest challenges we have there is based on the location of our stores, which are often not major metropolitan areas. And food share is such an eloquent way to address that because we can partner the store with a local beneficiary organization um, and reduce some of the costs associated with moving food around, but also have a tangible impact in the communities we operate. You know, we prior to food share, what we were doing was um, using reverse statistics to bring the food back into our distribution centers and then donating it to food forward. But that was resulting in some waste and doesn't return food. It was also meant that our stores weren't connecting, connecting with local communities. So it's something we've been working very closely with Food Forward on. And um, we're, you know, in the closing stages of uh, agreeing a partnership around the food share network, which is really going to mean that we're going to have closer ties with communities in, we operate, in which we operate. And also we're going to be able to reduce food waste from our stores, which we think is a critical issue. So absolutely, it's, um, it helped us catalyze some thinking and some programs that we've been looking at, but we hadn't been driving hard enough. Um, and it's something that we want to transition to being more sustainable in the long term. 
Just with regards to the logistics and the distribution, there has been obviously the regulatory requirements during the pandemic. Were there any that were in so, um, your movement or your of the food and how did you come around to that? So, I mean, one of the things that, that was useful for us is because we were an essential business, um, our food retail businesses were, we still were able to move food around, which was, I think, quite helpful um, from a distribution perspective, because instead of just delivering food to the food for DC and Johannesburg, we were able to make food available to the DCs and other parts of the country, specifically KZN and uh, Cape Town. And so we were able to work around those challenges. But the other thing that was potentially sometimes more of a challenge was not the regulations, but actually accessibility to products. So right at the outset, things like maize, pilchards, they were out of stock, and a lot of these items, suppliers were not, um, were not uh, the prices were starting to increase. And because of our, our position in the supply chain, we were able to make sure we could make that available, we could get a hold of that stock that wasn't available affordably, and we could donate it and increase the volume of, of food that was donated. So I think the biggest challenge was really around, um, at least initially, was around availability as people started to panic by uh, particularly staples. Um, and then the second thing was just around, um, there were some logistics challenges, but we were able to utilize the business and our big, you know, our big uh, macro and jumbo stores to overcome, us, uh, uh, overcome some of those issues because we weren't moving product from Joburg to Cape Town. We were utilizing stocks that were already around the country. Great. I think it's really encouraging to see that MESMAT is really coming on board and getting these new the, the initiatives to really build and on what on what has been started. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, now to my next guest, which is um, Mary Jane from Tiger Brands. So Tiger Brands has been one of the first corporates to respond to the frontline uh, frontline worker provisions and increased food support for, uh, for organizations needing to respond to the growing demand for food. Has COVID-19 necessitated a rethink sure. of Tiger Brain CSI strategy? Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation, Namsa. Um, Tiger Friends has always been uh, looking at uh, food and nutrition as part of its, uh, we call it SED uh, and not CSI because CSI has the connotations of being charitable, uh, whereas SED is uh, socioeconomic development. And our food program is, uh, we've got multiple food uh, programs. We feed uh, through the Tiger Brands Foundation uh, school kids in Quintal Four schools. Uh, those are the non-fee paying schools and we feed in about 103 uh, schools. The question was what happens to those kids during the hard lockdown? Um, you know, kind of they still needed to get fed. So we converted uh, the food that they were getting in school uh, into uh, food hampers that were delivered uh, to the schools and eventually then delivered to the families. And the reason why we moved from uh, having people come and collect at the schools is because uh, the beneficiaries were being mugged uh, on their way home uh, for these uh, food hampers. So we ended up having to go and deliver at their schools. So Tiger Brands Foundation feeding in the schools. We also have a program called Plates for Days, uh, which is our university feeding program. And we feed about 4,500 uh, students at uh, nine, nine campuses uh, at six universities. Um, and we continued, uh, we thought that because the schools would be, the universities would be closed, that there would be no need of feeding and providing uh, food hampers to universities. Little did we know that there were quite a significant number of students who found themselves um, actually stranded at the universities, and so we needed to continue feeding. Our biggest feeding program, uh, Namtla, is with our NGO partners, where we feed on a monthly basis uh, close to um, about 30,000 beneficiaries. Uh, and, and these food hampers are delivered uh, to our NGO partners. Um, and then uh, there's the, the last program is around uh, the near dated stock or the food rescue, uh, where we actually rescue food uh, that is about to reach uh, its uh, sell by date or best before date. Uh, we remove it uh, three months before it reaches that. And this is where the partnership with uh, Food Forward has been quite a, 
and need uh, a, 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 a significant partnership because we are through through them able to distribute uh, the, the near dated and access uh, stock that we have got. Why we changed, uh, you know, kind of what did COVID teach us that allowed us to be able to rethink uh, our uh, approach to this? Uh, as I said, Food Forward used to be just the partner where we, we did near dated stock, but what attracted us to Food Forward is the national footprint uh, that Food Forward has. Uh, and so we we graduated, if you like, uh, Food Forward into another one of our NGOs that would then get food hampers on a monthly basis to distribute to the areas that we haven't formally been able to reach. Uh, the frontline healthcare workers, uh, that uh, program we were able to fund with a salary sacrifice that, uh, that we as executives made of about 30% of our salaries, Plus, there were um, board members who sacrificed some of their board fees. And with that money, we were able to distribute, uh, I think, you know, kind of 10,000 uh, food hampers through uh, Food Forward. Uh, and we were also able to distribute uh, food hampers to uh, the frontline healthcare workers and about 12 million loaves of bread. Uh, the, the the sad thing is uh, when 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 um, you know kind of the the disappointing thing is that with some of the distributions that we did to healthcare facilities created uh, unintended consequences for these healthcare facilities. Why? Because some of the staff uh, began to see this as a right rather than something that was there. Uh, to support them. And I'm taking my cue here from uh, Crispian who said be be blunt. And the bluntness here was that uh, this what started off as a program to support healthcare workers who we were quite conscious that they were not able to leave their workplace to go and do shopping and that we would provide them with these food hampers uh, and support and alleviate uh, some of that pressure ended up in some of the partner facilities uh, that we had not working out so well that we were asked to actually stop because it was creating uh, issues uh, for uh, for the 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 one the people who were responsible for the distribution. Um, we haven't really uh, 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 altered our food and nutrition program uh, that much. Uh, we've just merely uh, actually accelerated it and brought on, as I said, new partners like Food Forward because of the need out there. And the worry for us, for me personally, was did we ever stop to think what happened to those people when the cameras were no longer there? When those who were responding at the, you know, kind of at the height of the crisis uh, were no longer there? When the general public was no longer talking about the long queues? Who was, who was supporting and continuing to uh, provide food for those who were vulnerable? Because hunger didn't stop because the cameras left. Hunger didn't stop because we moved out of lockdown five to three to four to five. To this day, it still continues. Andy uh, very correctly said that there was hunger before uh, the lockdown. There was hunger before the pandemic. What the pandemic did was just to, to shine the light uh, on the issue, but also to highlight the fault lines. So the fault lines were where, you know, kind of uh, the food was concentrated and the number of people that were vulnerable. And it, I think it also challenged us to say, can we as South Africans uh, in a country where a third of the food goes to waste and 12 million to 14 million people go to bed hungry, can we afford uh, to have that situation continue. Can we afford, and this is where I'd like to bring government in, can we afford to have the first world kind of uh, labeling regulation that says when something has reached its best before date, it's no longer uh, suitable for human consumption or use by date uh, determines whether, you know, kind of one day, one hour after the use by date that food is no longer are suitable for human consumption. I mean, just before the call, I was given a basket that somebody um, would like to donate uh, because uh, our uh, gifts and entertainment policy doesn't allow uh, employees to receive gifts above a certain amount, and this particular basket uh, uh, has exceeded. 
And as I asked my peer, I said, can we just look and see which of the food products are still uh, fit for human consumption? And half of the food that is in there, uh, the used before the use by date was um, the end of February. We are in March now. We've had to toss that into the bin. But who says that that food is not uh, fit for human consumption? So we need to actually uh, bring government, and it's a pity that there isn't a government representative as part of the panelists or part of uh, this discussion, because they need to be part of that in terms of how do we get you know, on top of hunger uh, and food waste? Part of it will have to be regulation that is governing uh, these programs. You've, you've actually just hit it because I was about to ask you that what it is that what is it that you uh, that you would think um, that you think government or the regulatory um, officers would need to do to enable the likes of tiger brains the last as quickly as possible to where it needs to be. Um, so you've you've kind of answered that question for me. Thank you so much, Mary Jane. Thank you. My next question goes to our next guest, which is uh, who is uh, Tatiana from WWF. Tatiana, 13 million South Africans in the areas hunger, though access to food is a constitutional right, and that is some of the evidence that suggests that South Africa will not meet the sustainable development goals, particularly goal number 12 of having per capita of food waste at retail and consumer level and food loss at production and supply chain by 2030. Has COVID-19 been a barrier towards SDGs and what action must be taken now, now to speed up the press? Thank you, Namla. That's a great question. And thank you also to Food Forward for including WWF here and to be part of this um, food businesses and retail panel, because I think lockdown demonstrated what a remarkable role the industry um, is playing. And it's clear just listening today and, and reflecting back on the past year how quickly they stepped up. But your question is very relevant. And, and I would say the answer to that, you know, will we meet our SDG goals? Um, more broadly, um, has COVID been a, a impetus or a barrier to that? I think the answer is yes and no. So yes, in the sense that COVID made us acutely aware of the inequality in South Africa. So we have long understood that South, South Africa is, you know, um, Andy made the point about the, the humiliating stunting rates in this country. Um, we are the most unequal country in the world, and I think it became starkly visible in COVID. And I and I think no South African, really, unless they have their head in the sand, can go on from this point without recognizing we all have a role in addressing that inequality. But I think ultimately COVID is going to be a significant barrier to us. Um, I, I think one of the primary reasons is that uh, the failure to distribute the COVID-19 vaccine in poor nations or developing nations is going to worsen economic damage. But even more concerning is this, um, you know, every nation for itself uh, approach that has been adopted in the, the vaccine rollout. And this, this vaccine nationalism um, has, I think, the potential to, to dampen ambitions across for uh, to meet global commitments across many developing nations. So already developing nations were feeling like we need to take pain in terms of limiting certain economic sectors, uh, shifting uh, energy systems, shifting uh, food systems into something that is just and sustainable while the, the developed world has managed to reap the full benefits of their resources, exploiting, uh, you know, their, their economic advantage. And now, um, you know, as things like the SDGs, the, the climate, the, the Paris Agreement ambitions, as we, we enter the critical final decade for achieving those, it's quite possible that there's going to be a pullback, a, a sort of a, a shift back to a nationalism because of what's happened in the COVID vaccine rollout. And your second part of the question, what um, action be, should be taken? This is, you know, this is a, a problem of, you know, dynamic, changing, complex system. We need 
you know, everybody has to act together. Everybody has to act simultaneously um, at multiple levels. I mean, Mary Jane very strongly made the point that we need government here. We need better management priorities right from date labels to understanding the, the value chain and every actor in it. And I think Food Forward is doing fantastic work in linking to farmers and really coming to terms with what the challenges are for farmers. And that's required investment in appropriate technology. And I think that again is something we're going to see in in uh, as a requisite in shifting both the problem of food waste, but actually the food system itself and the many problems we have in that system. And, and, and the second part of that is we're going to have to halt environmental degradation on land and sea and climate change. You know, these are two sides of the same coin. We won't solve the one problem without the other problem. And again, just to note that Food Forward and WWF are um, working to understand the avoided emissions that come with donated food. So once the food is produced, if it can't get into the market, it, if it rots in the sun or if it lands up in landfill, there's, there's significant implications, environmental implications. And so that's a, a very important offset or avoidance um, opportunity there. I think behavior change is going to be something across the system again, and, and that's a very challenging um, thing to think about. But again, I think this the effort, you know, one of the challenges with food parcels during COVID was that they tended to be very uh, processed food heavy, very narrow in their choices and um, the work of of food forward to get onto farms and to get fresh produce into um, the communities that need it. I think that's an extraordinary support in shifting diets and strengthening and the health of our um, both of our environment, ironically enough, and our people. And then perhaps my last point is the one that I think has been made by everybody and this, it's this issue for how we address inequality through this. How do we understand what it's going to take for inclusive growth? How, how, how do smallholders come into this picture and, and be supported in, in their efforts not just to produce but to avoid waste? How do we keep a dynamic and diverse market structure um, very much in evidence in South Africa. It was interesting that even as retailers and big business stepped up, so the levels of suspicion for those companies um, increased. So I suppose maybe my final thought might be that, you know, one thing COVID has taught us is that a nation that does well is one that protects its most vulnerable. And, and that's going to be something we're going to have to, to keep central to everything we do going mm. forward. What a great way to close off, Tatiana. I really uh, must say I totally agree with that statement. We are definitely an interdependent community, a global community. I've got a few questions that are coming through and I think I'm going to take, take one here for, for Andy. How can my organization join hands with Food Forward to assist my community and vulnerable families? So as you can see, quite a few questions are coming through from people wanting some food and um, yeah, the process is quite simple and seamless. Uh, organizations have to apply on our website and if you don't have uh, connectivity, then just call our offices and we will assist you with that. The process um, is quite short, but we have to do quite a bit of due diligence to make sure that we only support registered nonprofit organizations that have verifiable services in communities. So between one and two months, we were able to onboard organizations. Food share as well, there's a rigorous process that has to be gone through to be able to qualify for, for food support from us. But once you, if your organization is, is doing what it's supposed to be doing and you are registered and you meet our criteria, the onboarding process is quite, quite fast. I've just lost some of my questions. Andy, can you just pick up? Um, oh, here they are. Because of, so you've addressed the food parcels one. And what um, is the waiting period for? Yeah, yeah I, I think most of those questions are operational questions and um, I suggest people just contact our office and reach out to us uh, at uh, info at foodforwardsa.org. It would be our pleasure to be able to assist you with any queries you may have. Thank you so much, Andy, for for answering all of those and thank you to my panel. I uh, really appreciate you being here and I thank you for the great insights that you have shared with us. It is really great to see that we can actually 
work together and, and make South Africa a country without hunger. Thank you. You're all live. Thank you. Thanks very much, Namshla, for facilitating the first session and to our panelists uh, for participating in the session and sharing the insights. I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned from that and certainly a fantastic basis on from which to build. I'm very mindful of the comment that there are other partners that need to be in this conversation and that's something we want to attend to government being most noticeable partner that we need to make sure we bring to the table, as well as uh, the primary producers. But I think we'll say a lot about that to towards the end of the of the program. We're now at the point where uh, we introduce the uh, next uh, session, and that's uh, particularly around the management and measurement of the social investment, the, t the return on uh, our social investment. It's a, a study, as Andy mentioned earlier, that we've commissioned to ensure that we understand what the exact social impact is. Um, you know, very often we run organizations specifically it builds a momentum to do certain things, but if we can't measure the certain the, the impacts, um, it's often a, about our ego as opposed to the social impact. And so we need to have a, a fairly basic and empirical measure of the impact um, that we are making as an organization together with our partners gathered around the table here. 
Um, we now have the privilege of uh, having Marcus Kutsia, who's been a management consultant for a very long time, with about 20 years experience. Um, Marcus holds various uh, degrees, uh, masters in um, in social development, uh, masters in uh, in, in uh, an honors degree in business science, and a master's degree in social development. Um, most, uh, 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 Marcus has also worked with us and with various other organizations around strategically as, uh, assessing whether we are aligned with uh, our partners, whether we are aligned as an organization, as an industry uh, towards a common goal. So Marcus, we're extremely happy to have you facilitate the next session and I'm going to have hand straight over to you. Thank you, Crispin, for the introduction. Sorry, I was muted there. And I must say, just listening to the first session, I'm extremely impressed by how Food Bank has grown over the decade or so that I've that I've been following it. It's just it's amazing to sort of see what has come out of all those early conversations. So in our next session, we're going to focus more on the, the impact and we're going to hear from some of the beneficiary organizations that have received food from or via food, sorry, food forward. And the first person who's going to join us is going to be Tanner Metvin, who's going to share the results of the research report that was done last year on the impact that uh, Food Forward South Africa was having on its beneficiaries. And I'm very aware that we do have time constraints here. So in sharing that research report, what I think would be most interested to our, interesting to our listeners is firstly uh, a bit about sort of what approach did you use for conducting this research? And secondly, what would you say were some of the really interesting findings for you in terms of what you found about the organizations and their impact? And thirdly, to touch on this concept of social return on investment, we tried to come up with a formula for quantifying the impact of uh, Food for South Africa on, yeah, on people in need of food and on society and the economy. Okay, uh, Tana, are you with us? Excellent, okay. And unmute. Okay, Tanner, sorry, your microphone is muted. Um, it's the bottom of the bottom of the screen next to the video camera. We could always come back to that and. Hi, Marcus, it's Andy. Maybe, maybe you should go to another panelist and then we'll come back to Tanner once we sorted out the Perfect. technical That's pitch. Excellent. That's what I was thinking. OK, so part of uh, our we were going to have Tana originally introduce the survey results and explain, but we'll come back to that. Um, so we wanted to talk to some of the people that were, uh, we focused more on the impact in a sense in the second set of discussions. And I'd like to start off by just chatting to Warwick, uh, Warwick Berg from Old Mutual, and he's one of the panelists. And Warwick, if you could, you know, to briefly explain to us a bit about what this old mutual staff volunteer fund trust is and its work to support the elderly women and their children. And what I'm curious about is how does a trust like this uh, and Food for South Africa 
come together? I mean, how did Food Ford help the trust to achieve its own objectives on its beneficiaries? And Warwick, are you going to able to take a couple couple minutes and, and explain that to us, please? Sure. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, this is, uh, I, I think, something very close to my heart. So maybe just a few minutes. The Old Mutual Staff Volunteer Fund Trust, long name, short thing. We're a staff charity. Um, it's the money is donated by staff and it's run by staff. I am not in any uh, Old Mutual Foundation or uh, in corporate social responsibility. Uh, I'm just a worker bee that uh, does my own thing. And we happen to have a bunch of passionate people who are trustees and custodians of our colleagues' money. And um, that money is collected every month off our payroll. We've got roughly two and a half thousand people at Old Mutual who contribute a portion of their salary every month. That's from minimums, some in 10, 20 rand from our most junior people to we've got some people who give 10,000 rand plus per month of their salaries uh, each and every month into, into that. And so it actually allows us to build up a fairly decent little uh, nest egg every year. It's not in the hundreds of thousands, it's in the multiples of millions that we collect and have the privilege of, of distributing. Um, and, um, you know, food forward, we've, we've had a, a long journey prior to COVID as well, um, where, you know, we started very small with them in, in partnering and solving a particular problem that we, we had found, which was in many of those vulnerable groups, so we, we look after ECD, you know, abused children. So the, we've spoken a lot about child um, headed households, you know, huge overlap there, the LDD, women's empowerment. And a common theme in so many of the, the applications for funding that come from us is just the basics. Can you help us with, you know, feed the kids at school, feed the elderly? Um, and it was a theme that was just emerging more and more in the country. And I think a lot of really esteemed people have explained it a lot better than I have this morning already, but but we noticed this need as well. So what we did do is figure out we're not equipped to to go out and figure out how to solve that. Let's look for somebody who 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 is uh, and food forward were you know top of our list. Um, and so we started small with them, and I think you know in terms of the things that attracted us was this complete look through in terms of exactly where every rand went and being able to tie that back to a, a beneficiary organization and down to the numbers of beneficiaries. So our trust deed is very prescriptive about who we can give to and what we can give for. So that us being able to monitor is incredibly important to us. And ultimately, you know, maybe I should or shouldn't, but I, I almost care a little bit more because it's the staff's money. It's not some big giant fat corporate um, that, uh, you know, people think this is old mutual's money. This is the people that work there giving out of their, the goodness of their hearts. And, and we take that very seriously. So so I think that was the first thing. Uh, I'm a business guy. The cost per head was just unbelievable. And, you know, maybe your your previous one will, will highlight that a little bit more to the audience. But but literally the rand, the bang for buck of every rand that we give to for food forward is probably a multiple of 10 of what we could get anywhere else, literally. Um, and, and so that was was massively attractive. Um, and then perhaps maybe the last part of our journey is, you know, when COVID hit um, and was literally, I was think it must have been in the first week of lockdown or less, uh, Old Mutual was, you know, figuring out how we wanted to, to respond. Uh, we had spoken to government, government had spoken to us. And, you know, food security was this big thing. Schools had shut down, feeding schemes were gone, and overnight there was just this massive hole. So we literally, I think we were contacted by our head of corporate social responsibility, phoned me on the Friday morning and said, look, she's just spoken to government. How can we help? Um, we phoned Andy and his team, I think, at lunchtime. And by three o'clock, I'd managed to approve two million rand of staff money to go and give it to, to Food Forward um, for them to start being able to distribute. So we, we like to... Uh, pride ourselves on. We were we were in the first to jump in with Andy's team at the very beginning of COVID to get the ball rolling and everybody else we think has just joined because we did, but that's just us. Um, but I think the point is it's based on trust. The, the trust that we know Andy and the team, you know, they do what they say. We can see that 
complete chain from the rands that we take from our staff or get given by our staff through how it lands at the end beneficiary. You know, I get a list in Excel. Your money went to these 50 organizations, and within each organization, there were 22 here, 57 there, 112 there. It's it's incredibly, you know, a big, big part of what we do is, is to be, able, I think, as a social given, and it's one of my passions, is we tend to, I think, have, have, have somebody said it earlier, you know, this isn't about feeling good because you donated some money. There's lots of organizations I can give 30,000 Rand and 50,000 Rand to, but are they really making an impact? And that impact part is what has become really important to us as a staff charity, that, that literally the impact that Food Forward can demonstrate for us in Rands and cents, as I said, is multiples of, of anybody else in this space. And that's, it's that simple for us. Um, it's a rands and cents based decision of people who think the same way, feel the same way, and we share this common set of values. Um, and, and so that's what's made it special for us. We've, we've recognized Andy and the team at our Old Mutual has an annual staff volunteer awards, which is one of our big events sponsored and attended by our CEO and our entire EXCO just not last year, unfortunately. Um, and the, the previous year, you know, Andy was one of our recipients of our top partner um, at Food Forward. You know, that's how strongly we felt about the contribution and, and the partnership that we that we have together. Um, so that's really our story. I know it's a little bit rushed, but I'm trying to fit a lot into a short mm -hmm. amount of time. Uh, thank you, Warwick. That was very insightful. And just to endorse the importance of having transparency uh, in nonprofit organizations as uh, something that's really important and donors also value that. And Absolutely. so now um, we've got uh, Tanner's mic started working again. So Tanner, um, can we have your presentation please? And just to iterate on those three points, the methodology, what uh, findings you think were most surprising uh, to you, and then a bit about the social return on investment, how that works and what the conclusion was. Um, sure. okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. Glad it sorted out. Okay, great. So um, next, um, I'm going to briefly just go through the impact assessment that we did uh, for Food Forward, the kind of very specific things that I'm going to talk to you about today. This is a very long report. It's 91 pages. Uh, so I'm going to give you a very, very short summary. Um, so just very quickly, the kind of research intentions and methodology that we used, some of the key findings, and then how we came up with the social return on investment. Next. Next. OK, so from a methodology standpoint, the kind of core things that we were trying to understand was really looking at the kind of financial value of all of Food Forward's work uh, and how its model functions. We are also really trying to tease out very specifically the role that food plays in the delivery of other social services. So that's everything from healthcare, uh, education, um, uh, frail care, a really broad range of services. So we really want to understand how does food play a role in facilitating that. The period that we were looking at is all pre-COVID. So this is kind of to, uh, March 2019 to February 2020. That's the Food Forward fiscal year. And then the data, the, when we collected the data was between September and December of last year. And uh, the methodology we really used was first and foremost, looking at kind of the data that Food Forward collects on an ongoing basis from all its beneficiary organizations. We needed to go a lot deeper than that. So we uh, had direct interviews with the beneficiary organizations. We did site visits as well as surveying them. The, um, the our data set was completely representative of the Food Forward uh, beneficiary organizations. And what we kind of tried to align everything with is where are those organizations located? How large are they? And is our sample uh, representative of the types, different types of organizations? So what we did was kind of align everything that we did with Food Forward's complete data set. Next. OK, uh, just for the purposes so you understand what we've done, Food Forward categorizes its organizations, beneficial organizations across these 10 categories on the left. We created these three other groupings uh, to kind of uh, aggregate some of the data to have a different lens to look through and for simplicity purposes. Next. 
This is a reflection of where we actually collected the data from. Um, so this is where our sample set came from, reflected across the different provinces. Uh, it, it was focused on the six core that uh, they were functioning within prior to COVID. Next. Okay, the findings. Next. Okay, so I'm going to just talk very briefly about kind of some just core information about who these beneficiary organizations are, who exactly they're feeding, um, how their programs work, and where these organizations are getting their food. Um, so Food Forward is only one of multiple food force sources for them. And what is it actually costing them to actually feed? Next. So just a quick, this is a kind of a quick reflection of uh, how the organizations uh, that Food Forward is supporting fall across those three main categories. You can see it's very heavily weighted on the youth and community development services, uh, very well aligned with its mission. Next. This is a very confusing slide, but very quickly what this is reflecting is the gender split across all the social services that are being delivered by those beneficiary organizations. The purple is female and the yellow is male. So you can see that primarily it doesn't matter what the uh, organizational type is, females are the primary beneficiaries across uh, everything that's being done by Food Forward. Next. This is a, uh, an indication of kind of who is actually benefiting from the organizations that Food Forward serves, serves, and this is a kind of split of their income. So you can see very heavily weighted on uh, people getting support for food that are only relying on social grants as their only source of income. So obviously the kind of poorest of the poor. Next. Um, this is a reflection by organization of how many people they're feeding on a monthly basis. So what's interesting to note is that a lot of Food Forward's beneficiary organizations are very small. Um, so they've got a lot of organizations that are feeding a small pool of people, and these are very, you know, kind of local, uh, critically critical service providers. Uh, so, you know, uh, over 50% of the organizations are feeding less than 200 people a month. Next. Um, one of the things we wanted to try to understand was uh, based on the food that is being served, um, if size and or type of organization might be a fundamental driver of what is actually being served. So obviously, you know, a meal is not a meal is not a meal. So different organizations are providing different kinds of food to their beneficiaries, and we wanted to really deeply and richly understand that. So surprisingly, there was not a massive amount of variance, both in terms of size, uh, as well as type of organization. Some of the biggest variances that we found were within health organizations providing uh, a larger percentage of meat products than the others, as well as uh, fresh fruit actually really small. So um, again, you know, a little bit surprising and you would also, you know, wouldn't have expected, but small organizations are also providing a larger portion of meats to their beneficiaries. Next. Um, this is uh, just a quick visual snapshot of um, what amount of food the uh, beneficial organizations are getting from Food Forward um, in whatever kind of, uh, you know, typically it's monthly, uh, but you can see it kind of skews to the 100 kgs all the way up to 600 kgs to the lion's share of organizations in terms of what they're receiving from Food Forward on the increments that they receive it. Next. Um, these two reflect, uh, you know, kind of how people are accessing the food forward system. So you can see on the on the left hand side, 76% are getting straight from the warehouse. And again, this is not necessarily the case now, but it was when this the, under the period we were reviewing. Um, and then on the right, the graph is reflecting how frequently they're getting food from food forward, and the vast majority are getting it on a monthly basis. And those that would be getting it more frequently, we'd be primarily using the food share program, which you can see is. 16% of the overall food access that people have to the food forward system. Next. This is a critical thing to understand and it, it, it feeds directly into how we have calculated some aspects of the social return on investment. So food uh, food forward is, is re representing 34% of the overall food basket of the organizations that we reviewed. Um, this is also in line with what food forward wants to have happen. They don't want to be the sole provider of food um, for all their beneficial organizations and this aligns very closely with what their core intentions are, which is about 
So it's interesting to note that, you know, so 29% is coming from uh, cash purchases, if you will, that these organizations are spending on food, 28% from other uh, donations they're getting uh, from other food organizations, and then 9% from their own food gardens, which is actually quite much higher than I would have expected. Next. Um, again, we, we wanted to kind of segment the data set to look at whether size and or type of organization was a fundamental driver of where people were accessing their food. Um, again, less variance than I would have expected. Um, so, um, you know, one, a couple of key things to note here uh, on the, um, uh, the youth development services is that they, uh, they're the ones that are kind of at least accessing their own food gardens, but they tend to be small organizations in the main, but otherwise it was relatively uh, closely aligned both on size as well as type of organization. Next. Um, this also is another way to kind of understand the size of the organizations that Food Forward is supporting uh, beyond just how many people they're servicing on a monthly basis is also to look at the size of their budgets. So you can see if you look at kind of that gray bar in the middle, which is kind of a million, 500,000 rand to a million rand a year, and then look to your left, that represents about 60% of the data set. So 60% of the organizations are functioning off of an annual budget of less than a million rand. So we're talking about very small scale organizations. Next. Um, now, here's the est their estimations of the cost per meal. Uh, as you can see on the far left, 15% didn't know what it was costing them to feed. And then it goes all the way to the other continuum, which is kind of above 100 Rand a month. So there's a really broad range, um, but things tend to skew very heavily, uh, kind of in 30 Rand or less per meal. Next. This cost has to be put into context because the organization, we, we look very intimately at how these organizations are qualifying what they're spending on food. 50% of them are only looking at the actual direct cost of the food, which is actually a cash reflection of the, of the cost of food. And they're not accounting for any other costs that go into feeding someone, labor, overhead, and et cetera. And this is again, only reflecting the cash that they actually spent. So those estimates of the cost per meal are actually extraordinarily low. So it's actually costing them substantially more than what it was shown on the previous slide. Next. So on to the impact of Food Forward SA. So a couple of key things that we we're trying to pull out here. Um, one was the kind of uh, graph on the left was, would you be able to continue meals without uh, the contribution of Food for SA, 70% said yes, 30% said no. Um, then on the right is the food you receive from Food for SA enough to run your feeding program. Very important, uh, this particular stat. So 25% said it is and 70% said no. Um, so that it is a, again an indication of the size and scale of organizations that Food Forward is supporting. Very small and very dependent. The smaller ones are much more dependent on Food Forward than the others. Next. Uh, we also want to look at this data in terms of size. So this is reflecting on what I was just saying, that the small organizations are much more reliant on food forward uh, to deliver their feeding program. Next. Um, this is a critical issue that we were trying to get our to get to grips on is uh, if you look at the bottom left hand corner, uh, we would have to stop the program, which is in essence saying that if Food Forward no longer provided food, this organization would no longer be able to provide the other social services that they're delivering. So food for 41% of these organizations is a fundamental driver of their ability to deliver other social services. So this is an absolutely critical stat. On the far right, 47% is a reflection of what kinds of they would have to actually make adjustments if Food Forward was not there to supply food to the other social services that they were offering. Next. I don't know if it's my eyes or not, but everything on the screen's gotten blurry. OK, there you go. Um, so the um, this is also another key stat, which is uh, uh, kind of what level of adjustment would you have to adjust your program if you no longer had food forward food? And that's not related to food provision. It's related to the other social services. And 81 percent of the beneficiary organizations said yes. So this is again an indication of how critical food forward is into the broader both food ecosystem, but also social service delivery ecosystem. Next. 
Okay, now onto the social return on investment. Next. Okay, when looking at the social return on investment, the, the way that we calculate this is the first thing is to kind of try to map uh, what food forward's impact actually is. Um, then we have to kind of assign a cost or a value that's created from what we have mapped. We have to look at what does it actually cost food forward to deliver that value. And that's how we ultimately come up with the calculation on what the social return on investment is. So the four broad categories that we looked at in terms of mapping were the kind of um, uh, cost that was saved from reducing the carbon emissions uh, from having that food go to use as opposed to going to landfill. We look at the cost of actually diverting that food from landfill. We look at the value of the total meals that were served by the beneficial organizations. And we looked at the value of the social services that those organizations provided that were enabled by food. Um, so all of the costs that we associated and did these calculations with were independently uh, verified and validated. None of these costs uh, came from food forward or values came from food forward. Um, in looking at trying to do these calculations, one of the things that's important for us to uh, consider is that what we call dead weight, which is basically looking at the totality of the food that food forward provided that went to the beneficial organizations. What percentage of that ultimately did not get used? or was not counted. And that is everything from spoilage or overages or actually on donations. So, so multiple organizations that are being supported actually will on donate some of the food that they get to other organizations. And that is actually not counted. So we had to remove that from the calculations. We then had to look at uh, all the, the uh, feeding that's being done by the beneficial organizations. What uh, amount of that feeding is actually attributable back to Food Forward. And then we had to do a detailed analysis of what is it actually costing Food Forward to distribute all this food uh, and implement their entire feeding program. So there are elements of what Food Forward does that were not included in our calculations, um, but the lion's share of what they were doing uh, was calculated, so we had to kind of remove those costs. So ultimately that's how we, those are the kind of elements that we use to uh, get to a final social return on investment. Next. So if you look at the, the, the these numbers are what Andy referred to. So in the bottom right hand corner in that in that division calculation, 1.6 billion rand of value was created by Food Forward's efforts in the fiscal cycle of March 2019 to February 2020. Um, and that is a one to 98 rand leverage. So that is an extraordinarily high leverage of one rand spent will create 98 rand of value. So it's absolutely extraordinary and I have not come across a, that kind of value leveraging in any of the other organizations that we've worked with. Next. And finally, an, another way to can look at this information and consider it is to kind of just pull out the food side and not look at any of the other you know, kind of ecological and or social service value delivery uh, and just looking at the kind of total kgs of food that were donated, um, which was basically 5 million kgs that created uh, 15 million meals that were directly attributed to Food Forward's food and 588 million rand of value. And then in very simplistic terms, you donate one kg of food that creates three meals and 117 rand of value. And that's it for me. I know I spoke really quickly, but I had a lot to cover. Thanks. Mark. That's perfect. Thank you, Tanda. Sure. Um, that's a very impressive ratio. That's also one of the highest I've ever seen in terms of the social return on investment from food. Um, something I'm sure our listeners are curious about is the social return on investment measure. Is this something that's easy or difficult to do? I mean, how widespread uh, applicable would something like this be to other organizations that, for example, a beneficiary organization might try to do a similar calculation? Is that something that's recommended or not? You know, so, so it is, unfortunately, it's very complicated because you've got to access a lot of external data to verify what costs actually are. Um, I think, you know, the primary focus for the beneficial organizations that Food Forward is supporting is really about accurate accounting. Uh, so it's accurate accounting in terms of 
quantifying and qualifying who's actually being fed on a regular basis, how many times that same person is being fed. So you're not double counting saying I delivered this many meals, which is a direct equivalent to how many people I served when it's oftentimes not because the same person is sometimes being fed uh, and actually uh, real accounting related to the cost of food. Uh, the cost of their individual meal purchasing. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done inside of the beneficiary organizations related to just getting to grips on what exactly they're doing and making sure that it's accurate. Going to the social return on investment is a, another leap um, that is would be difficult for most. Okay, no, thanks. That explains things. And it's interesting how we've had that theme about transparency come through on two occasions now. Uh, with Warwick Adult Mutual and yourself just talking about the importance of record keeping in organizations. So Andy, if, if you're with us, can you please, when will people, so firstly, sorry, thank you Warwick for that. Sorry, <laughs> thanks Tana, um, I'm getting a little mixed up this morning. Uh, Andy, how would people get access to this report? Because I've read it and it's very interesting and there's a lot more information in that report than what Tana has described. Absolutely. Thank you, Marcus. I, I must confess it's it's a it's a 91 page report and we are still busy digesting and chewing through the report to make sense of the data and see how we can adjust and pivot to make sure we have an even better uh, value proposition for our beneficiary organizations. However, uh, now that uh, we, will, we, will, we will do a, just a, a press release next week, uh, launching just the summary of what Dan has spoken of the impact and then we will make the document available. It will be available on our website where all our documents are stored um, and our governance uh, page um, and we will make it available where our annual reports are. We will make the document available or if anyone wants a specific copy from us, uh, it's a large document, but um, uh, uh, please contact us individually. Uh, and we can make sure that you receive a copy uh, 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 from us and um, you can speak with uh, maybe just send an email to info at foodforwardsa.org uh, or, or if you if you're familiar with us and one of our partners just give us a call and we will make a copy available to you it is some really fascinating reading and i want to thank impact amplifier for for thoroughly going through that and 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 uh, you know, interrogating the data and making sure that we arrive at uh, at independent, verifiable uh, social return and investment. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. And I I went through the report yesterday over a cup of coffee, and it was definitely easy to understand. So there isn't it's it's something which uh, I think beneficiary organisations would be perfectly comfortable looking through, and so seeing some of their own impact on paper. So now we've uh, with the next segment of this webinar is to look at the experience of three beneficiary organizations for how they've been using this food. And when we've done that, then we will then hand over back to Kristen, the chairman, to sort of close the webinar. So I'd like to start off with uh, Chris Lockwood from Razor, Razor of Hope. And Razor of Hope works uh, or implements a variety of programs in Alexandra Township in Gauteng. And Chris, Perhaps you could introduce yourself and explain to us how an organization such as yours with such a wider range of programs uh, uses the food that you receive via or from Food Forward. Uh, Trish? Hi, thank you so much for this opportunity. I hope you can all hear me. Um, so uh, we've been working in Alex for 30 years, so we are well known within the community and our programs are well established. Um, and our initial approach was very much during COVID to look at partnerships because we understand that we can't do this and reach the broadness of Alex on our own. And so um, the, the Hope for Alex campaign was really a partnership between 30 of the Alex organizations um, that we have worked with in the past and identifying the most vulnerable amongst all those uh, partner organizations. Um, we had a really good team of social workers who did um, analysis and assessment and based on their recommendations, food was distributed and um, we thought we would get a thousand uh, hampers distributed and that was done in the first week and we were able to carry on for the following, you know, four months. Um, 
distributing food. So it's really such an important part, but it is only a part of how we operate. We've understood that food is is a good door opener, but there are so many other services within the, the, the family structure that we work with that um, we're now focusing a lot more on those um, like violence in families, like trauma and, and counseling, um, whilst maintaining our, our feeding program um, at our center for children. Mm. And Trish, can you perhaps just elaborate a bit more on this concept of door opening? Because I know that one of Food Ford's objectives is to use food as a catalyst for other things. And that seems to be what is happening in your case. Well, absolutely. I think for many people, certainly those that we had met in, in the community, the, um, the ability that we created for them to make a call and say, we need help. And for us to then to be able to deliver that help provided an open door to then say, after you know lockdown level five and four and three, we'd like to come back and see what other assistance we can be providing. Um, and so um, I think it has opened you know many doors to to understanding Alex better, um, as well as many more people in need. Okay. okay. Thanks, yeah. that, was, that was very insightful. So thank you for that explanation. I'd like to move on to talk to Gerard Furi from Witkopen Health and Welfare Clinic, or uh, as known as just Witkopen Clinic. And I'm curious about how, how does a clinic use food parcels? And obviously a clinic is concerned with the health of its patients. And how have you seen health of patients change or improve as a result of the food that you've received via or from uh, Food Board South Africa? Uh, Gerard, please can you tell us a bit more about your work? Uh, Thank you, Marcus. I think it's a real big opportunity to speak to a group of people like you. Uh, specifically also to our benefactor uh, Food Forward and uh, also to say that there's other, uh, other people also that support. And uh, first I just would say that uh, I think that uh, we have said earlier that uh, we should not celebrate. But what we are saying, we are celebrating relationships currently that can help us to actually improve uh, the in poverty society in uh, the northern parts of Johannesburg. We know that it is part of the richest, area, richest areas here, uh, but we sit with uh, 1.4 million people here in the, in the north part of Johannesburg, which is impoverished. Mm -hmm. So your, your question was quite direct, and I think that, you know, it is, we uh, have experienced uh, uh, in this country, no, no, there is still a good civil society care. Uh, and I think that as COVID has brought out of a lot of people, you know, at least that, uh, you know, in the past, uh, you know, there was almost like a fatigue in helping the society. But I think COVID has actually brought out a lot of benefits uh, to the society through people. Okay. So Wittkoppen Clinic, uh, you know, we've been here for 75 years. So uh, although we are multifaceted and multidisciplined uh, uh, clinic, we also serve a group of people on orphans and vulnerable children, and also a group of child-headed households, which form part of our uh, uh, care that we do have to our patients. So our patients is a very co co there's a strong comorbidity in our patients. We mainly serve uh, for the HIV and TB group, and of course, uh, very important to HIV and TB group is uh, nutrition. Uh, if you can get their nutritional status up, uh, you know, uh, their health improve. So uh, that is uh, where we fit in, you know, and, uh, you know, I think uh, what what the program has helped us is uh, it's helped us to actually uh, uh, improve our services and our care for the people, the vulnerable people uh, from about 100. We, we talk about households 
and not meals. Uh, we served about 100 households a month. Now we're actually between 400 and 500 households that we actually care for. So it's very important for us. And I think the big lesson that we have learned uh, during COVID is that uh, nutrition is not just about eating. Uh, it is about the good physical health. It's also about good mental health. And I just want to stress the thing of mental health here. It is that, you know, a person that eats well uh, is also mentally stable. And we also do have a program amongst the mentally uh, impaired people. And we find that it's very, very, when the moment you actually support them in that sense in a household, you get stability in a household. So I, I think that is one of the things. And I think uh, the contributors to Food Forward and this, this program can take it home. Uh, you know, that it's not just nutrition. Uh, you know, there's a big impact on the mental health also of society uh, serving them in this. So, uh, but what it has also helped us, uh, uh, Marcus, through you to the group, is that we've also started uh, amongst us a, 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 a vegetable garden amongst this group. So we've got three sites now in the northern part of Johannesburg. Uh, vegetable gardens, mainly mothers of uh, care for uh, orphan uh, children. They actually run it. So we know that out of those gardens, they do get fresh fruit uh, on a daily basis. So, you know, it has opened other doors for us. Uh, we're still exploring. We can grow. There's a lot of space that we can use, uh, but that is where we are. Okay. Uh, thank you, Harald. That was very, that was very clear and it's, it's very encouraging just hearing stories like that to see how the importance of food and the role of food in people's wellness and how your organization has, despite these circumstances, been able to, to nevertheless expand its impact. Because uh, certainly the future is going to require a lot more of your organization sort of work. And so I'd like to move on now and talk to uh, Marshall Runquist, who works with a nonprofit organization called Grayton Concision Town. And, and the organization works in the town of Grayton, which I've been fortunate to visit, uh, or at least in, in the Western Cape. And as I understand it, um, Marshall, your organization runs a variety of programs, a lot of them focus around the green economy. And, and I'm curious, how, do, how does um, surplus food fit into your strategy? And how do you use food to act up the communities around Grayton? while at the same time, your organization is involved in food production. And Marshall? Great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Can you hear me that side? Mm. Can, you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great stuff. Thanks. To, um, yeah, thanks for having it. And Food Bank, uh, Food Forward or Food Bank, I mean, are we, we I started way back with, with, and it was still Food Bank. And um, we've been, with, with Food Forward for about uh, uh, six, seven years now. And um, what's been amazing is just that kind of partnership throughout um, the years, seeing Food Forward, how they've grown to like where they are now at the moment. So I think just to um, recap on, I mean, the surplus food and where the food is going from, from that we are getting from, um, food forward. So basically we running a what they call a swap shop in the area where people are empowered to come and get food at certain areas in this local area, Grayton and Vanata not. So basically people bring recyclable goods um, and they are then um, given a food parcel or food that's coming from food forward. So that is just a kind of incentive that people get um for um to collect recyclable goods um, like plastic and glass around the area at the same uh, at at the same time we're adding kind of value on waste which has been a huge impact for us in the last five years because we could see some amazing in improvement in our local environment um but also that i mean that, that started getting um, us thinking because one of our main works is around food security and that's around vegetable gardening and how to plant food and that started becoming a kind of income for people as well. Um, we have two 
local markets in, in our area that we run weekly on a Wednesday and Saturday. And since since like a year ago almost now when COVID started, we've empowered people to start giving people seedlings and compost and advice how to start the garden. And then we commit as a organization to buy in their food for these local markets and eateries around the area. So there was a huge impact of people um, having an income via the vegetable garden. Um, well, it's also been amazing in the last. Um, so we've been the only um, NPO in the Overberg area that has gotten food from Food Forward before. And just for the people that's outside of Cape Town, we are about 145 Ks out of Cape Town. And we we had to go and get the food from the warehouse in Epping once a month, which obviously cost us about 800 bucks to go and get it. And also the danger um, from going from um, Overberg into Cape Town with lots of food uh, was always, always an issue for us. Um, what was what what was amazing was the rural depot and coming out to us in the Overberg. Um, our work was um, the organization looked at other NGOs in the areas that that could also join the food forward and um, uh, spoke to Andy at the time and and he said to me, Marshall, if you get more NPOs in the area that could join the food forward, we can actually come out and deliver a truck of food um, to your base where people can, where other NGOs can come and collect that. Um, and that's been working amazingly. They've just been here last week as well. Um, and so they come weekly, I mean monthly for about say eight NGOs in the area now um, where they also benefit at the same time. Yeah. So thank you. That's, that is very encouraging to see things expanding. And I gather that the, the concept of food depots. Um, sorry, Andy, are you with us here? And perhaps you could just elaborate a bit more on this concept of food depots, which I understand has been a recent innovation of food forward. Yeah, that, absolutely. That's what yeah, thank, thank you, Marcus. I, I think uh, when we look at the past uh, year and a half, I think that was our single best decision we could have made. Mm -hmm. uh, because our warehouses are concentrated in urban areas, because that's where the food environments in, in, in interactive activity takes place. So we're near the distribution centers uh, and near retail stores, etc. Our, our warehouses were concentrated in urban centers. Mm -hmm. But that, what that has led was, what, what that is, uh, I suppose, done was, it's um, negatively affected our ability to be able to support rural communities mm -hmm. because people had to come from far to fetch their food. Uh, prior to the mobile rural depot model, all organizations had to come to our central warehouse to collect food. But we realized that it was prohibitive for organizations like the one Marshall runs at uh, GTT mm -hmm. and others. And so what we now do on a monthly basis is we, we've got a list of the, 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 the 100 poorest municipalities in the country and we're working uh, against that list and we, and we are looking at communities and seeing where are the poorest needs and, and where are the poorest people and what are their needs. And we now take food, our trucks take food on a, on a, on a monthly basis to those depots. In fact, today we are in the Southern Cape where we're supporting George Neisner, Plettenberg Bay, outsourced organizations with food and we've taken a, our massive truck to be able to to do that. So we've actually increased over, over the past 12 months, in spite of COVID, we've increased from six mobile rural, communi uh, rural communities to 13 communities uh, just in the past few months. And we're scaling that up in the next year as well to reach more rural communities. As you know, I don't need to tell you and others this, but um, rural communities are even further affected by poverty, inequality. They don't have access to as much resources as in urban areas. And so while 15% right now of our bill population is focused on mobile rural depots, that will increase to like 30 okay. or 40% in the coming in the coming year. Okay, thank you, Andy. What's been very encouraging just listening to uh, this webinar so far and the stories that have come through is how activities have grown and expanded and innovated over the last decade. And what's very clear to me, and I'm sure others that are listening, is that despite the amazing impact that's been achieved by these organizations, this problem of food is not going to disappear in South Africa. 
and is going to continue for a very long time still. So before I hand over to, to Crispin, uh, thanks Warwick and Prish and Karat and Marshall and for your stories and the insights about how food is central to the work of your organizations. And also how um, food helps catalyze other changes. And, you know, if it's changes in health or changes in local economy or changes even in just access and participation and of people with organizations. So thank you for that. And I'm going to hand across now uh, back to Crispin. I, th I think we're on a, a tight schedule, so. And Thanks, Marcus. OK, let, let me do that rather than. OK, perfect. Crispin? Marcus, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to the panelists for sharing that with us. I think we've heard from a very important set of stakeholders and partners and, you know, the BO, the beneficiary organizations are a critical part um, of this. I mean, they are effectively the representatives of the communities that are most vulnerable. And I do reflect on uh, on Tachana's uh, comment that a nation that does well is one that protects its most vulnerable. So effectively, they represent that community and uh, very important for us to hear from them. Um, there are a few things I think that's come through for me today. Um, firstly, thanks to everybody for the insights, but some of the insights that uh, that has landed with me again, and uh, like I said, I've been involved in this for about 16, 17 years, um, is that more than just restoring dignity to people through food and empowering communities, we as a board have recognized repeatedly that food is a catalyst for change. And it's very encouraging to hear uh, with the beneficiary organization stories, Trish and Herod, how food is an, you're able to attract people so that on the back, on the basis of that, you can do other things. You can skill people up, you could medicate people. Um, many years ago, about nine years ago, we had a program where you, we used to reward people with food if they take the tuberculosis medicine, because the challenge with tuberculosis is that you need to complete your course of medication. And very frequently people interrupt that course of medication, and then the process has to start all over again and reinfection um, happens. It was a particularly prevalent in the Western Cape. So we used to ensure that people take the medication in order to qualify for the food, and so we could enable some kind of catalyst for, 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 for broader social change. Um, the second thing that's come through is partnerships. And I think if, uh, Andy and many people have mentioned that. We've heard that from uh, Mary Jane, um, from Zinzi, that we can't do this without partners, um, without the retail partners, without primary producers, the farmers, and without manufacturers. And then, of course, with beneficiary organizations who are organized and able to deliver the kind of uh, services to individual beneficiaries and to measure and manage that efficiently. So we kind of sit as the logistics chain in the middle and the big part of the challenge with all of this is how do you transfer surplus to from one end to the other and there's a huge logistical and uh, resource intensive um, requirement for that to happen efficiently. So we need to do that with partners and I hear very loudly that um, there are a couple of power partners not at the table. Um, government is certainly one because we need to start thinking around regulation at a base level and policy at a high level. How do we start influencing policy so that we can help streamline this process and get, get more food, more of the surplus to people who need it, and we can make this whole process a lot more efficient. So government's a critical partner. Um, what Andy may not have mentioned is the fact that we are, have also, through the, with the assistance of Woolworth, Pick and Pay, Food Lovers Market, we've been able to get to the primary producers where the, the majority of the surplus sits. And when you do have the opportunity to see Tanner's report, you will see that although there's often a lot of criticism towards retailers because it's so visible what the loss is on the sell-by date, the bulk of the loss actually happens at the primary level, at the primary level of production, manufacturing, uh, uh, um, growing or manufacturing. 
So those are important people that we're very excited. We've now got to the table through our program called Second Harvest, where we actually get fresh produce from farmers, and they have been incredibly engaging with us in, uh, in, in supporting those initiatives. So we, I hear from you the importance of getting those partners to the table. And then transparency. Um, there are some uh, developmental areas that Tanner's uh, project has, has, has exposed. We'll certainly have to look at that, but we committed to transparency. Once you have a sense of where the benefit goes to, where the money that you contribute to food for, how it is spent, I think you know that helps to re-establish our credibility, uh, organizations such as our credibility. The big question always asked is what's the cost of administration versus the benefit um, that's derived by the uh, um, end beneficiary. So I think we are committed to transparency and driving efficiency repeatedly. Our very blunt measurement instrument is always total gross tonnage divided by total operating cost, which is what gets us to about the 80 cents per meal. And it's a 250 gram of balanced meals that we um, that we use as a measurement. So that uh, that's something we'll keep doing. And then um, finally, you know, the 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 the, the thing that becoming quite that we're becoming aware of is we are it's within our power to eliminate hunger. And we used to say in our lifetime, um, that's too far. You know, I believe within 10 to 15 years, we are able to eliminate hunger in South Africa. We're able to do it now, but it's literally just getting the system to work more efficiently in order to do that. Our mobile rural depots is a clear demonstration of our ability to reach more people without having to build physical infrastructure. So we are very much uh, uh, committed to the goal of eradicating hunger. I think the next um, frontier will be to start focusing on the quality of nutrition that we're able to offer people that's kind of designed for the requirements of that community. We're already doing a lot of that stuff at the moment, but I think there's a tremendous opportunity to do that. So I'm left with uh, nothing much to do other than to thank the people who participated in here. I mean, firstly, I want to thank Namshla and Marcus very much for your facilitation and for your willingness to uh, to, to fulfill this role. Um, I want to thank the uh, Century City people who, who really may have accommodated and helped us with all the technology during the course of this, uh, of this process. And then um, I do want to thank our panelists and our partners, uh, particularly I want to start with the beneficiary organizations. You know, the work that they do makes our work possible because they organize in communities. If you don't have an organized community, it makes it impossible to reach people. So the beneficiaries are a vital cog in this entire mechanism that they organize, that they have reach, they have credibility, and they pretty much know what they're about. And then, of course, our retail partners who are well represented here today, um, they don't just give us food, but they think through processes, they test us, they challenge us, we don't always agree on stuff. And then we go back and we work out something and we come up with a better solution. And I think that's how we are constantly striving to be better together. And then there are people that are not around the table, which we'll make sure we bring. And then to Tana you know, just for the objectivity with which you've approached this and the deep insight and the methodology you've used has helped us. I mean, this is a real guiding document for us on the things that we need to improve on and on the things that we know we're doing okay on, but we still have a lot of work to do. So um, this won't be a once-off exercise. I think we are committed to doing it on a regular basis just to start, you know, having a sanity check not to drink too much of our own Kool-Aid or believe our own propaganda, but have external people um, test that for us. So that that uh, I, I'm really grateful for. And then to food, the Food Forward team, you know, many of you will say, yeah, they get paid to do this. Um, they do, but most of them, if you visit our depots, I'd say 100% of the people who work for us believe in what we do and why we do it. They're driven first and foremost by the mission of eliminating hunger and making sure that the vulnerable people in South Africa are served with dignity and empowered through the provision of food. 
And uh, to them, I do a, a huge debt of gratitude uh, for organizing this and for the work that they do. To the rest of you sitting, listening through this, uh, through this and for the little bit of time that we've ran over, I really hope it was worth your while. And I do want to invite you to engage with us. Please, please engage with us. If there's something you don't agree, um, one of my professors used to say, uh, feedback is the breakfast of champions. So uh, to the extent that you're wanting to give us good or bad feedback, please, we are very happy to take your feedback, to engage with you in smaller groups if that's necessary. And we are committed to making sure that this kind of engagement is an ongoing one to the point where we can just make the process work better, more efficiently and with a boss in mind. And that's the hungry in South Africa. That's effectively the boss we aim to serve uh, in what we do. So thank you very much for your time and thanks for all the participants. Have a fantastic day.